Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inshallah, today we are starting from verse number 18 of Surah Al-Jinn, Surah number 72. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihi al-ladhin astafa, khususan ala sayyidi rusuli wa khatam al-anbiya wa ala alihi al-askiya wa ashabihi al-tadiyya amma ba'd. Fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa anna al-masajid lillahi fala tad'u ma'a Allahi ahada. وَأَنَّهُ لَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ يَدْعُوهُ كَادُوا يَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِ لِبَدًا قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَدْعُوا رَبِّي وَلَا أُشْرِكُ بِهِ أَحَدًا قُلْ إِنِّي لَا أَمْلِكُ لَكُمْ ذَرًّا وَلَا رَشَدًا قُلْ إِنِّي لَنْ يُجِيرَنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا وَلَنْ أَجِدَ مِنْ دُونِهِ مُلْتَحَدًا إِلَّا بَلَاغًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِسَالَاتِهِ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَإِنَّ لَهُ نَارَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا حَتَّى إِذَا رَأُوا مَا يُعَدُونَ فَسَيَعْلَمُونَ مَنْ أَضْعَفُ نَاصِرًا وَأَقَلُّ عَدَدًا قُلْ إِنْ أَدْرِي أَقَرِيبٌ مَا تُوعَدُونَ أَمْ يَجْعَلُ لَهُ رَبِّي أَمَدًا عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَى غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا إِلَّا مَنْ ارْتَضَى مِنْ رَسُولٍ فَإِنَّهُ يَسْلُكُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ رَصَدًا لِيَعْلَمَ أَنْ قَدْ أَبْلَغُوا رِسَالَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ وَأَحَاطَ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ وَأَحْصَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عَدَدًا صدق الله العظيم So we start from verse number 18 and we are in the middle of Surah Al-Jinn and as we discussed last week the creation of jinn how they are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we covered some of their uniqueness some incidents regarding the jinn that we hear um, from the narrations that have been narrated in front of us and then we also talked about the the incident that took place for this surah being revealed. <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ was one day leading salah and a group of jinn were passing by. <clears throat> and they heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting verses from the Qur'an. And then when they heard these verses, they immediately directed their attention to the Prophet ﷺ. And they fell in love with what the Prophet ﷺ was reciting. And ultimately they accepted Islam, they went back to their people and they propagated Islam in their communities. Moving forward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 18 says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا That indeed, the masajid are for Allah, so do not invoke with Allah anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He says that indeed the masajid are for Allah. What does this mean, the masajid are for Allah? So linguistically, this word can come from two possibilities. Either it could be from a word in Arabic which we would refer to, which we call in language, Masdar Mimi. Or the second possibility could be from what we call in Arabic, Ismul Dharf. It's from two possibilities, the word Masajid. It's a plural. The question is, what is the singular of this? What's the singular of this word? Is it Masjidun or is it Masjadun? And the scholars of Tafsir have taken both pathways and they've defined it from both ways. The first thing, the first definition, if we take it from a Masdar Mimi or from the singular Masjadun, the translation of this sentence would then be that indeed the sajda is only for Allah. Generalizing it. That sajda is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is sajda? Sajda is lowering oneself so low that it is the lowest point that a person can, you know, put themselves down. So basically where your forehead, the highest point in your body, touches the lowest point on the ground, the, the ground, you know, the earth. And you touch that and beneath that you can't even go. You can't even penetrate beneath that. You are basically lowering yourself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, you don't lie down. Because when you're lying down, you become completely helpless. It's as if someone forced you there. You're still on your hands and on your knees where you're showing that I have the ability to push myself up. But even though I have the ability to push myself up, I'm still going to lower my head in front of my Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very unique position where a person has the ability to stand up because he's on his knees and his hands. He can easily push up. Yet he's still with all consciousness lowering his forehead in front of the great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar. And he says that as he goes into sajda. And while he's in sajda, he says, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. That glorified is the Lord the highest. Al-A'la meaning the highest. Glorified is the Lord the highest. And it's a very intimate moment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in one hadith that the closest the servant can be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is while he is in, in sajda. That's the closest a person can get to Allah. You and I would think the closest we can get to Allah is the higher we get in the skies. Maybe if we go higher in the, you know, in a plane or higher in a rocket, we're getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is what Fir'aun thought. Fir'aun, he said to his people, he said to his architecture, Haman, Ya Haman, ibn li sarha la'alli ablughu al-asbab, asbab al-samawat, attari'a ila ilahi musa, wa inni la'avunnuhu kadiba. He said to his architecture, Haman, 
that ubnu li sarha, make for me a staircase. And what will be the purpose of the staircase? La'alli attali'u ila ilahi Musa. So I can go and see the Lord of Musa. I want to go meet him. And if I start climb the staircase, maybe I'll reach a point where I can see who Allah is and where Allah is and what Allah is. And then he said, وَإِنِّي لَا أَظُنُّهُ كَاذِبًا And I believe Musa is a liar because I know when I climb the skies, I'm not going to see anyone there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ زُجِّنَا Right? What happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ زُجِّنَا Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ زُجِّنَا And what he did was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he beautified these foolish thoughts, سُوءُ عَمَلِي these foolish thoughts of Fir'aun were beautified for him because he thought this was good logic. Let me climb and see if I can find Allah there. But the reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, isn't seen by simply going high in, in an elevation. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, proximity is gained through lowering yourself in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why we as the servants are referred to as the abd. The abd means the slave, those who are slaves in front of Allah. And the slave, in order to gain closeness to his master, lowers himself. He doesn't lift his chest out and show arrogance. That's what the Prophet wasallam says in another very beautiful hadith, that whoever humbles himself, Allah will elevate him. And whoever lifts himself up, whoever shows pride and haughtiness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lower him down to the ground. The exact opposite of what our logic is. We think that if we show arrogance, pride, and some power, people will honor us. It doesn't work like that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because possibly what you're showing off to people is something they don't have. You know, if I show off, you know, a nice garment, or if I show off a nice, you know, uh, what do you call this, a nice pen, or if I show someone like, you know, some good basketball skills, it may amaze you because you don't have what I have. You guys understand? But imagine you're, you're trying to show off with your basketball skills in front of Rose. He's going to look at you and he's going to puff like, are you serious? Hey, this Pakistani guy showing me his skills? Or this Indian guy showing me his skills? You know, what kind of skills are you going to show someone who works, who plays on a national level? So when you show your skill to someone who already has what you have, rather than being impressed by it, he's going to think, what a fool. So how are we going to impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything that we possess from, the worldly, from, from our worldly experience? As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have it. Allah has this and many more faults. That's why whenever we try to show off in front of Allah, we look like fools. We actually end up shaming our own selves because we shouldn't be doing that. Ultimately, when you stand in front of someone who possesses something, and you say to him that, you know, you have this, you know, and you lower yourself, be a little humble. <coughs> Rather than being, you know, showing off in front of that person, that person will ultimately end up respecting you. That yes, you know, he's humble. So and a humble person is one that you like being close to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one who lowers himself, Allah elevates him. And the Sahaba and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew this. This is why whenever they face a difficulty, the companions, they say, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he faced a difficulty, what's the first thing he did? He prayed to rakat. Immediately on the musallah. He wasn't calling his financial advisor or you know, the, 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 the marketing manager or something like that. No. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ had an issue, the first person who he called was, he went on to the musallah, he called on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He prayed his salah immediately. And the same thing with the companions. Ka'bra radiallahu anh is about to be killed. And they're hanging him outside Makkah Mukarramah. He's been captured and they're going to kill him right now. And before they kill him, they say to him, do you have any last request? And he said, yes, I do have a request. They said, what's your request? And he said, I want to pray two rakat. And he did wudu, he prayed his turaqat. And after he prayed the turaqat, these turaqats, he prayed them very quickly. He kind of rushed through it. You know how we rush through our prayer? He rushed through the prayer. And after he finished off the prayer, he said to his companions, do you know why I prayed my salah fast? He said to these people who were about to kill him. Do you know why I prayed my salah fast? They said, why? He said, because I, want, I didn't want you guys to think I was stalling my death. I didn't want you guys to think I was stalling my death. He goes, salah wasn't there to stall my death. Rather, I was just saying to Allah, oh Allah, let me at least bow in front of you one more time in this world so I can be proud of that in the hereafter. And it is said regarding Ka'b radiallahu anh, that he was the first person to pray two rakah salah before dying. This is his sunnah. He is the one who started this. And before he died, he said a beautiful piece of poem. He said, أَنَا لَسْتُ أُبَالِي حِينَ أُقْتَلُ مُسْلِمًا عَلَىٰ أَيِّ شِقٍ كَانَ لِلَّهِ مَضْجَعِي He said, I don't care whichever side my body falls on, as long as when I die, I can say I was a Muslim. Because after they hang me, my body is going to fall. Either it's going to fall to the right, either it's going to fall to the left. Either it's going to fall forward or backward. He said, I don't care whether my body falls to the right, whether it falls to the left, as long as I know that I prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I died, I'm willing to move from this world. Right? And they had the value for Turaqat. It's said regarding one companion. 
that one companion, he was, this is a famous narration, that one companion, he was traveling and he met this one man. And the man said to him that it seems like you're lost. The companion said, yes, I'm lost. He said, let me help you to reach your destination. And then when he took him to his destination, he was showing him the pathway, how to get to the destination. And on the way there, this man said, there is one way we can go this way, but it's a long route. Or we can take this way right here through the woods, and it's a short route, and it'll get you to your destination faster. So the companion thought, let's take the short route. So then he took him there, and a point came where he came to this area where they were in the middle of the woods, and there were bodies lying everywhere. And he asked this man, what's all this? He said, well, now it's time to tell you the truth. I'm actually a bandit, and I'm a highway robber. And I bring all the people here, and this is your destination. He said, now get off, and I'm going to kill you and rob all the stuff and leave your body here. So this person said, okay, before you kill me, can I pray two rakat? He said, okay, go ahead, pray your two rakat. And when he started praying his two rakat, he went into sajda and he made dua to Allah. It's a very special tasbih that he read, right? And he read this tasbih. And he read it once, he read it twice, and the third time he read it, he saw a man come on a horse and came with a spear and killed that man. This sahabi finished off his salah, he asked him, what are you doing? Where did you come from? He said, when he read the first tasbih, the gates of Jannah began to shake. When he read the tasbih the second time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the gates of Jannah and said to me, go, you are the one that's going to answer his call on my behalf. And he said, when he read the third tasbih, I came and I pierced him right through his chest. And then he recited the verse of the Quran, the angel recited the verse of the Quran, أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَى That, who is there? Right? أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ Who is there? Other than Allah, the one who answers those who are in dire need. Who is there that answers those who are in dire need? Other than Allah, أَإِلَاهُمَّ Allah, Do you have any other Lord with, other than Allah that can help you at a time like that? And the Sahabi says that this was my experience, how my sajda pulled me out of my difficulty. And Aisha radiallahu anha and all the other companions, there are so many examples like this where Sahaba would, you know, they would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever they were in difficulty and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would remove their difficulties from them. Because they realized that when they were in sajda, they were very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's unfortunate, we face difficulties. But very few of us actually consider reading Turaqat and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this true or false? This is true. When we move into a new house, how many of us actually consider the first thing I should do in this house is pray salah? Before anything else, let's pray Turaqat right now, right away, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses this place. How many of us actually, when we go to a city, the first thing we do is go to the masjid and pray Turaqat there? This is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is exactly what he did. Whenever he came to a place, the first thing he did was, if it was a house, he would pray Tura Qadr. If it was a masjid, he would go there and pray Tura Qadr. Always praying Tura Qadr, praying Tura Qadr, and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because their sajda was their connection. That's why they say, uh, Salatu Mi'raj al Mu'min. The salah is actually the ascension of the believer. You know how the Prophet went on his ascension, his Mi'raj? The salah is your Mi'raj. It's your opportunity to stand in front of Allah, lowering yourself in front of Allah, and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, it is said regarding Aisha radiallahu anha, that she spent an entire night crying in prayer while reading the dua in sajda. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub, sarrif qalbi ila ta'atik. The entire night she spent crying and making this dua in front of Allah. And what is this dua? Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub. And this is the dua that relates to all of us. We should make dua like this. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub. Oh Allah, the turner of the hearts. You know the word heart? You know what we call it in Arabic? What's the word for heart in Arabic? Anyone know? Qalb. Not, don't say qalb. Qalb means dog. Okay? You don't want that being your heart. Qalb or taqa. Qalb is what we call the heart. You know why qalb is called the heart? Because qalb in Arabic means to turn. What does it mean? Taqlib means to turn something. Okay? So when you turn something from this position to that position, when you change, this is what we call qalb. When you turn from one side of the bed to the other side of the bed, this is also referred to as qalb. You know, you're turning. And the heart has the ability, the heart has the ability to turn. You know, the hand, if you can lift five pounds with this hand, is it possible the next minute you can lift hundred pounds with it? Most likely not. Your, your hand can't turn that fast. But the heart can love you with complete attention and devotion and with sincerity. And the second second, what can it do? It can hate you equivalently to the same level. That's the heart. When you see someone, when you, you know, someone says to you that there's a potential girl for your marriage. You think to yourself, subhanAllah, just by hearing that name, now your sleep is gone, and you're excited, and all you want to see is a picture, and a profile, and marriage, bio dada, right? One of those. <laughs> That's what they call it in our, in our culture, bio dada. Right? They want to see one of those, and you're just really excited and goofed. 
But the second you see that picture, like, and all that excitement just gets washed right out sometimes, just by seeing. And it's interesting how the heart can change like that. Do you guys understand? Intellectually, you can't convince a person that quickly either. If you believe in something intellectually, is it easy to change that person's thought? It takes time. You have to work on them, work on them, work on them, work on them. But the heart, on the other hand, changes just like that. It believes here, it loves here, tomorrow it hates there. That's why Ali radiallahu anh, he says something very beautiful. Um, the narration is quoted by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi in his Al-Adab al-Mufrad. It's the second to last narration. It's my most favorite narration that I read in that book. Even though all the narrations are beautiful, they're all a hadith, very beautiful. But as a child, I loved that hadith a lot because I thought it was very beautiful. It really related to me. And what did Ali radiallahu anh say? He said, Ahbib habibaka hawnam ma asa in yakuna baghidaka yawmam ma. And I haven't read this hadith since after that day. Maybe when I read this hadith, I was probably 12, 13 years old. But I still remember the exact words. He said, Ahbib habibaka hawnam ma asa in yakuna baghidaka yawmam ma. Wa abghid baghidaka hawnam ma asa in yakuna habibaka yawmam ma. And what does this mean? The rough translation. He said, Love your beloved so much, keeping in mind that tomorrow he may be your enemy. Love your friends so much. Don't get over attached. You know, love them, be good friends, but keep everyone at a distance because tomorrow, Asa yakuna Tomorrow that person may become your, your enemy. So be careful. And then the other side, he says, hate your enemy so much to a limit. Because tomorrow he may become your he may become your friend. And you have to then know how to deal with him. But if you went overboard with him, then you can't. And if you went overboard with him, you won't be able to take him as an enemy because the second he becomes your enemy, now he's going to exploit you in front of the world. Now, having that balance. And the qalb, on the, uh, the qalb is something that, you know, it turns. Right? It turns from here to there. And the Prophet Aisha radiallahu anha, in this sajda, she's making this dua, Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub Oh Allah, the turner of the hearts. Thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Make my heart firm on your deen. Don't let it turn away from the deen. Make it firm. I don't want it. You know, the heart is like a fish. It turns. But with my heart, once it settles on the deen, once it's on that side, just nail it. Bam, thub it. Nail it right in, and I don't want it to turn from the deen ever. And then she said the second part of the dua, and this is a prophetic dua, by the way. It's in the hadith as well. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub. Sarrif qalbi ila ta'atik. Oh Allah, the changer of the hearts. The heart has the ability to turn, and it also changes, right? It changes in its way that sometimes it's attracted to something, sometimes it's not attracted to something. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub. Oh Allah, the changer of the hearts. Sarrif qalbi ila ta'atik. Change my heart towards your obedience. Today I may not like it, but once my heart loves obeying you, make sure it doesn't leave there. You know, and some of us may have experiences in our life at some point that all of a sudden we enjoy worshiping Allah. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe it was during one dua that you made or some tasbih that you made or once when you were going to Hajj Umrah where all of a sudden salah just became enjoyable. And you started loving reading the Quran. You're reading the Quran one day and you're like, wow, this is so much fun. I never read it like this before. I wonder you're reading some tasbih and all of a sudden you just start enjoying it so much. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us this dua. And this is actually taken from a verse of the Quran, right? This is actually taken from a verse of the Quran that we, you know, these things where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, these duas are ultimately, they're prophetic. They come from revelation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching this to the companions that make this dua, O oh Allah, the turner of the hearts, turn my heart and change my heart towards your obedience. So the heart here, this dua that Aisha radiallahu is making of her iman, the obedience of Allah, she's making this in sajda. The sajda is a very important, you know, act of worship for the believer. So here we're saying, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَادِ That the first possibility of this word, masjadun. Let's take it from that root first, which is masdar mimi, which means that, and sajda is only for Allah. In the previous nations, sajda was allowed to other than Allah, but only for the sake of honoring, not for the sake of worship. Because sajda is of two types. There's what we call, there's actually of three types. Sajda is of three types. The first type of sajda is what we call sajda ta'zimi. Sajda ta'zimi means you are doing sajda to honor someone. So for example, you see a, a big king and you do sajda in front of him. Or for example, when Adam alayhi salam was made, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show the superiority of Adam alayhi salam over the angels and the jinn. That's why Allah said to the angels, prostrate in front of him. So to show the greatness and honor of Adam alayhi salam, the angels prostrated in front of him. This sajda, we call it sajda ta'zimi, which means to show the greatness of a person. The second type of sajda is what we call sajda to shukr, or sajda lishukr, which means you are, you are doing sajda to thank someone. Someone did something for you. You know, 
Um, for example, when, um, you know, when Yusuf السلام, was sitting on the throne and his brothers came in front of him and his mother and father were there and his dream came true where the 11 stars and the, and the sun and the moon bowed out in front of him, they say this sajda was for shukr. They were thanking Allah that Alhamdulillah the family has finally come back together. Right? A sajda shukr. Or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, for example, that if I was to order anyone to do sajda, if I was to order, he didn't make this command, he said, if I was to order anyone to do sajda in front of anyone other than Allah, I would order the, the wife to do sajda in front of her spouse. Why? To do shukr. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given me such a great spouse that I prosper. But even that's not allowed. Let me make that very clear. Okay? It's not allowed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if I was to order. The third level of sajda is what we call sajdatul ibadah. Sajdatul ibadah means you prostrate or you bow down as an act of worship. That now you're worshiping that person. The previous two, the first two sajdas, the former two, were actually allowed before Islam. The former two were actually allowed before Islam. The last one was never allowed in any religion because we only worship Allah and there was no religion that ever came before us or no religion that, you know, Islam or anything, you know, no one can ever claim this. That sajda is allowed for anyone other than Allah. The first two were allowed in the religions before. The third one was never allowed by anyone. But now in our time, the scholars say, all three sajdas are not allowed for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone wants to do shukr of Allah, he goes into sajda. Some scholars say it's okay, some scholars debate it, no problem. If someone wants to see the greatness of Allah, he does sajda, no problem, you can do sajda. Out of worship, sajda, do sajda in front of Allah while praying to rakat, no problem. But other than Allah, we never prostrate in front of anyone. However, if a person does prostrate in front of someone else, out of honor or shukr, will he become a kafir or not? That's the question. If you see someone doing sajda, if someone does sajda in front of his parents, he shouldn't do it, should he do it? But let's say someone does do sajda in front of his parents. Does that make him a kafir or does, is he still a Muslim? Right? Many people would say that would make him a kafir. And that's a big mistake. The only sajda that makes someone a kafir is when you do sajda with the intention of ibadah. If you do sajda with the intention of honoring someone or thanking someone, it's a sin. What is it? It's a sin. It's masya. It's ithim. It's a sin. But it is not kufr. Be very careful with the word kufr. We see, I see people in our community sometimes using the word kufr too fast. They're very quick on throwing it out there. Someone that they're upset with, someone they try to work with, someone that isn't doing things they want the way they want them to, they quickly throw that kufr word out there. But remember the Prophet wasallam said to us, that if you say someone is a kafir and he's not a kafir, then what happens to that kufr? It rebounds right back to you. Then you're in the hot spot. So be very careful when calling someone a kafir. Don't let your tongue do it. Even if you have 99 reasons to call someone a kafir, unless you heard him say with his own tongue that I say I'm a kafir, don't call him a kafir. Because every word of his, every statement of his can be interpreted. You guys understand that? Every statement can be? It could be interpreted. Someone came the other day and said that, Sheikh, Allah loves me so much. Allah loves me so much. And this brother, mashallah, you know, good brother, but still struggling with a lot of things, you know alcohol, swine, a lot of other stuff that was happening that shouldn't be happening. But he said that, I don't believe Allah will punish me. I don't believe Allah will punish me because of Allah's love for me. Now this statement can be taken both ways. The first way it can be taken is someone can say he's denying the fire of hell, therefore he's kafir. And one of the brothers there, that's exactly what he jumped to. He said in front of me, he said, Sheikh, that person, he said Allah won't punish me. He's denying the existence of Jahannam, therefore he's kafir. I said, brother, take it easy. Why are, you, why are you so eager on kicking him out of Islam? What I see from that statement is that maybe he was just a little extra with love with Allah. Maybe he had a little extra hope in Allah. And he said, you know what? You know, I know I'm a sinner, but Allah loves me so much. Inshallah, Allah won't send me to the fire of hell. You guys understand it? That same statement can be taken two ways. Our responsibility is to always go for the better one. Go for the Islam. That's what we want. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a revelation, which obviously the Nabis are gone, now that can't happen. Or for example, that person very clearly comes out with it, that I'm a kafir, then that's another thing. But other than that, what happens is people, when, they, when you call someone a kafir, what I've seen is that it's like a drug. When you call someone kafir once, it feels good for certain people. They get happy over it. Because it shows them power and authority. You know, um, Brother Rashid, I don't know, I keep, I keep referencing him in the, in, in the, in the street class. Someone's going to think that he's actually a point of reference. But he mentioned this story to me. And I'm mentioning his reference because he's here. So you guys know that Mufti Sahib doesn't just make up stories as he goes along. Someone came and said that to me, Mufti Sahib, do you make up half these stories? 
<laughs> so he, Rashi Sahib was once telling me a story that there was a brother in the community who accepted Islam at Brother Amir's hand from MCC, for those of you guys who know who, did, who was involved with a lot of da'wah work. So he accepted Islam at his hands, and then they didn't meet for a while. Then this brother started differencing an opinion. Brother Amir, Amir, what's his name? Amir Ali, brother Amir Ali, yeah. So he, was, so he said that they didn't meet for a while. This brother who accepted Islam, brother Amir Ali, who's known for being this individual who did so much da'wah when he passed away. You know, there were many, many, many people who attended Janazah Salah. So finally, after a very long time, they met. This person who accepted Islam at his hands and brother Amir Ali, who was at the forefront of giving da'wah towards Islam. When they met, this, this brother said to him, brother, uh, I just want you to know that I think you're a kafir. <laughs> brother Amir Ali is like, what? You're, what are you doing? You know, what's wrong with you? Certain people, they get excited. It's like an addiction. They love giving that, they saying the word kufr. They, like, they love calling people kafir. And I've seen this with my eyes. Literally, I've seen this with my eyes. People go, you know, people, when they get into this whole addiction of refuting other people and speaking out, and this rad and tankir, and they love refuting and rebuking other people, it's an addiction. And we actually do it other than the folds of Islam. You know, many of us who aren't so religious, maybe we don't do it there, but everywhere else we'll do it. Someone says, this is a good dish. What are we going to say immediately? No, it's not. We'll argue back right away. Or someone says this, someone says that. Someone says, you know, um, this, this race is better than that race. And we're going to immediately, you know how people love fighting back on everything? In religious matters, people do this too. And you go on the internet and you see it happening. Literally, go on the internet, I'm telling you. Go on YouTube and you'll see it. People are just non-stop jabbing and fighting, jabbing and fighting, jabbing and fighting at each other. I saw on Facebook the other day, there was a post that someone po posted up. And when I was reading through it, I was thinking to myself, Ya Allah, it literally took me almost probably 20 minutes to read one post. It was a very long post, right? Facebook needs to follow Twitter's model, you know, where if you're going to speak bakwas, limit it in 120 characters. <laughs> And you know, long post, and I was reading it because it caused so much controversy. I saw scholars in England referencing this post in their lectures. So I said, let me go read it. So I went online and I was reading and I was thinking, Ya Allah, what is this? You know, it's, it's a big mess where people are just, they get a kick out of making fun of each other and, you know, saying this person's wrong and that person's wrong. And we've given Islam such a strict definition that if you don't meet that, you're a kafir straight up. Right? And I've seen people from the Indian subcontinent do this. With all due respect, with all due respect to the tradition that you know, I've come from, my teachers have come from, but people who follow, the, for example, the Deobandi tradition, or people who follow the, what do you call this, the Tabliq Jama'a tradition, or people who follow the Tasawwuf tradition, or people who follow the tradition where no madhab is followed, or people, you know, with all, within all the traditions, I'm not pointing out either one tradition. This is common within everyone. Literally, I've seen this. I saw one brother, and I don't want to give examples because then you can hit some sore nerves, and then people get upset that all oh, Mufti Sahib's making fun of our group. Well, I, that's not my intention. My intention is to tell people here that be very careful before you point a finger at anyone. Is to be very careful. Because you don't know what that person's perspective is. You don't know. Once you understand that person's perspective, then you'll see where they're coming from. Okay? So that's why we say when it comes to the matter of kufr, iman is to do with the heart, kufr is to do with the heart. And unless we don't see kufran bawah, clear, explicit kufr, we are careful of ever calling anyone a... Eh? Kafir. And that's why the first interpreting here, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ That indeed, sajda is only for Allah. The second interpretation of this word is وَأَنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ It's a plural. Masajid is a plural of the word masjid. That's the second possibility. If we take this possibility, then what it means is that indeed, masjid means masjid is a scale of Arabi which we call ism dharf. It's a unique scale. Maf'alun is an actual scale. Maf'ilun, it's a, it's a unique scale within that category of, 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 of the noun. It means a place of worship. Masjid means a place of sajda. For example, on the very same scale, we have another word we use, mashriq. Maghrib. Mashriq means the place of the sun rising. Maghrib means the place of the sun setting. Masjid means the place of doing sajda. You guys understand that scale? So therefore now, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ That means, indeed the houses of Allah, indeed the places of worship, they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, when we talk about the masjid, we have to make a differentiation between a masjid and a musalla. Have you guys ever heard words like this? You guys ever heard there's a musalla? Someone may say there's a local musalla here. Or someone may say ICC is a masjid. Or someone might say that place is a musalla. 
There's a difference between the word masjid and musalla. There's a technical difference. Even though they both may have the same functionality, both of them are used for prayer, both are used for Quran, both are used for lectures, they may have the same functionality. But technically, there's a difference. The difference between both is this, that once a masjid is made into a masjid, then it can never reverse. You can never make that into anything else. It will remain as a masjid until the Day of Judgment. You guys understand that? So let's say, for example, I have a land. In my house, I have a house. And in my house, I have a room. I say that this room is a masjid. I have made this room a masjid for the sake of Allah. Now that room, what will it be? It's a masjid. If someone buys a house after me, what does he have to do with that room? He has to keep it a masjid. Let's say, for example, I have to, I go low on finances. I'm selling my house. Can I sell that room? I can't sell that room because that room doesn't belong to me. It's a masjid. It's for the sake of Allah. It's gone. You guys understand? And that room will remain a masjid or this place. A masjid remains a masjid until the lowest part of the ground and the highest part of the sky. You guys understand that? So it's a sacred land as far as it goes above us until as far as it goes. Or as far as it goes beneath us as far as the land goes. That entire area is considered a masjid. So can you build a toilet there? You can't build a toilet then. Not even on the second floor, nor the third floor, nor the fourth floor. About a hundredth floor, can you build a toilet there? Above this square ground? You can't. Can you build it underneath? You can't. The only exclusion is, is if when you make the masjid, you say that, Oh Allah, I am making this a masjid, not the second floor. If you make that exclusion right at the beginning when you actually make the masjid. You guys understand? If you just say this land's a masjid, now what happens? As far as above, as far as beneath, what happens to that place? It's a masjid. But if, for example, I say, no, this floor is the masjid, the second floor is the masjid, but the third floor will not be a masjid. I make that attention at the beginning. Then you can make an exclusion and then exclude that part. Otherwise, it will all be a masjid from top to bottom. I dealt with the case in this in England. I remember when I was doing my iftah, there was a question that came from Leicester. Leicester is a famous city in England. And what happened was that there was a masjid they built, and later on they found out that underneath the structure of the masjid, there was a sewer line running. So they asked that, is this permissible? You guys understand? And this may even be may even happen in American masjid. You have to actually give it some thought. I don't know whether, I hope not in any of our masjid, but it's very possible. You just have to see the city planning and see whether there's a sewer line running underneath you. And it's very possible it may run because if you look on the streets there, there are gutters everywhere. I mean, the, the, the caps are everywhere. You can see them. So when, when they said, the fatwa was brought in and we discussed it. And ultimately, the rule was given that we have to convince the city to go around the property. And they then had to do the repiping all over again. The Muslims had to give, you know, contribute to it because that's okay. That's not a problem. We can pay financially, inshallah. Allah has given us wealth. We can pay for that. And we had to then get the, the pipeline to go around the masjid because whatever is a masjid is all the way neath, all the way to the top. Do you guys understand that? As for a musalla, do all of these rules apply? No. Today I have a small little property. I have an office. I make one room musalla. We pray there tomorrow. I sell the business. That room you can turn into whatever you need to. Okay, I have a house, I make one room into a musalla, we pray salah there, tomorrow I sell the house, make it into whatever you need to. Today I'm renting, a, I'm renting a property from a third person, and I have this place into a musalla, tomorrow when we sell the property, or tomorrow when I can't pay the rent anymore, you can make it into whatever you want to. You guys understand that? The same rulings don't apply with the musalla, but, the same, but there are different rulings for the masjid. Now, functionally they're both the same though. That's only a technical difference. So whatever rulings apply for a masjid, we should also keep those same etiquettes and same rules for the musalla too. Which are, when you enter inside the masjid, or when you enter into the musalla, which foot? <coughs> same etiquettes. When you leave, which foot? Left foot. Dua when you go in. Dua when you come out. When you're sitting inside a musalla or a masjid, you don't talk. You lower your voice. You do dhikr of Allah. You read Quran. You make dua. You don't waste your time in the masjid. The purpose of a masjid is to connect yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Avoid texting in the masjid. Avoid Facebooking in the masjid. Avoid your Twitter in the masjid. Avoid your email in the masjid. Avoid your voicemail in the masjid. Avoid checking your phone every few seconds in the masjid. If you think your phone is going to be a distraction, don't even pull it out in the masjid. You know, it's the best policy. The best policy you'll ever convince yourself to in your life is to take your phone and leave it in your car when you come to the masjid. Or turn it off completely. Don't even keep it on. Literally. You know, just cut it off. And if you do that, you'll be amazed how much more you can actually focus in salah. A simple gesture like that. A simple gesture, turning your phone off, not silent, what did I say? Power down off. You know when you're taking off in the plane, they tell you, 
Um, anything with a battery must be turned off. Anything with the on and off switch, you must turn it off right now. Right? And then the cabin crew will, will let you know when you can turn it back on. I've heard that so many times. You know? I actually did research on this. I was wondering why is it that they, why they don't allow it. So they say that there's a pulse that comes out. You know, most, most um, accidents that take place with aircrafts usually occur within the first 10,000 10, feet. That's where they usually occur. So once you hit 10,000, they usually allow you to use it. So, um, and what happens is that when the, when the aircraft takes off, they fear that there's some kind of pulse that will come out or radiate from the electrical devices, and it may, it may cause some kind of um, uh, confusion with the communication from the pilot to the communication tower. But it's interesting because um, the pilots themselves, you know how they uh, gauge their direction or how they work through, the, through, through their guidance in the air, knowing the weather and where to go, what not to go. You know what they use? They use tablets. They actually use tablets themselves. Yeah, they have that, they have tablets there, right? And they use the tablets, you know, these these I don't know Android and Apple tablets. They use these things and they and they, and they use these to navigate themselves. So then I asked them. Um, I I looked into it a little more. I was going on going on the internet and searching. So one of the causes they give is that the reason why they tell people to turn it off is because so people pay attention to the air hostess when they're informing them of, of security information. I was thinking, Subhanallah, you know, Subhanallah. They force people to listen to the security air host, so you know the security team of the, of the security guidelines to the air hostess by telling people power down. This is actually one of the causes. I'm not. It's not something that's speculative. This is actual cause. And then you pay attention. People pay attention. Some people sleep, but that's their choice, right? You know, human beings are very hard. By the way, you can put as many as restrictions you want on people, but whether they listen or not, it's up to them. You guys understand? Whether you listen or not, it's up to them. You can cut them off for every, you know, the, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made salah in such a way that if you don't focus in salah, there's something wrong with you. You're not allowed to talk. You can't look here and there. You can't move your hands around in salah. You have to stand in one place. You did wudu washing yourself from your sins before you came there. You have to listen to what the imam is doing, so you need to pay attention. You, there's recitation going on. You're doing the tasbih while you're praying salah, so you're engaged. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is, much, this is all I can do. There's nothing more than that. The next thing that I can do it, you know, tell is tell the angel of death to come and stand behind you with a with a dagger or something. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made salah in such a way that if we don't focus, there's nothing else that can be done. You guys understand what I'm saying? But yet we've made every attempt and we've proven to Allah that guess what? I still have a way not to focus. You guys heard that famous story? My teacher used to always tell us this story. It's a funny one. Where there was a shift, he was leading salah, and after salah was over. The, the, the people who are fought, the, the musallis from behind, they said to the sheikh that you only read three rakat. The sheikh said, I read four rakat. You guys heard that story? And they were fighting back and forth. The sheikh said, I read four rakat. And the people behind him said, Muqtadi said, no, you read three rakat. And they got into this huge fight. <coughs> so what happened was that one guy came from the back of the masjid. He said, Mulvi sahab, you have fifteen rakat. Padhi. He said, Mulvi sahab, you know, sheikh, our dear imam, I want you to know you've only read three rakat. So the imam looked at this guy like, who's this shmo? Like, you know, I'm the big imam here. Behind me are a line of mufti scholars and shiuch, and we're debating, where did this guy pop out of? So he said to the, the sheikh said to this man, how confident are you that I read tirakat? He said, I swear by Allah, I take an oath by Allah that you only read tirakat. The sheikh said, wow, these guys weren't confident enough to take an oath. I'm not confident enough to take an oath. That's why the debate's going on. But this man's taking an oath. What makes you so confident? He said, Mulvi sahab, meri char dukane. Translation, he said, Mawlai Sahib, or dear Sheikh, I have four stores, and everywhere on the way home, this masjid comes here. And I pray Isha Salah behind you, and in every rakat, I do the counting of one of my stores. I've done three, one still remains. Oh. I've done three, one still remains. We've proven to Allah that guess what? You can put all the restrictions on us, you can send us to a nice calm place. You can send us to a place that's clean and pure and beautiful, a masjid. You can send me to a place where I can't even do things that are inappropriate, but I'm still going to find a way around that. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ That indeed the masajid are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدَا So do not invoke with Allah anyone. Okay? وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدَا That indeed the masajid are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not call on Allah, do not call with Allah anyone. Do not call Allah with Allah anyone else. Keep your sajda only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're doing your sajda, 
only for the sake of Allah. Don't do sajda for anyone else. This is very important what I'm saying to you. When you're praying your salah, you know, may Allah save, may Allah forgive, you know, myself and everyone sitting here if we've ever done this in our life, where we're praying our salah and we prayed those two rakat for anyone else other than Allah. That happens. Sometimes after Isha salah is over, after Maghrib salah is over, we think to ourselves, should I just go home? Then you think, no, if I leave, that person is going to know that I didn't pray my two rakat. What's he going to think of me? And you say, you know what? Let me just pray two rakat real quickly. We've prayed that two rakat for other than Allah. That salah was never for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in this ayah here, فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَا اللَّهِ Don't do it for anyone other than Allah. Only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I'm not encouraging you, may Allah save all of us, give us all purity and intention, and give us the tawfiq and ability to worship Him with passion and love. But if you're praying to Rakat for other than Allah, I ask you, don't pray it. You understand? Don't pray it. Go outside. That's why the Prophet wasallam, most of his sunnah's prayers, where did he pray them? Back at home. Because now when you enter into the house, whose choice are you praying by? Your own. You should, you know, if you think it's going to help you pray your sunnah because there's an environment and stuff, okay, pray in the masjid, no problem. But for those people who have ability, where should you pray your sunnah? At home. My teachers, I saw one of my teachers, Sheikh Bilal, after salah was over, he used to walk right out of the masjid. Right when salah was over, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, make dua, and then what would he do after that? Literally, he would jet out of the masjid. He would never pray his sunnah prayer in the masjid. I never saw him praying his sunnah prayer in the masjid. Never. I don't recall even once. <coughs> Where would he pray his sunnah prayer? He would go to the office and pray there, or he would go home and pray there. You guys understand? So now when you're praying those two rakat, or when you're praying those four rakat, when you're praying the witr, whose choice are you praying it by? <coughs> you're praying it by your own choice. But at the same time, keep in mind the trick side of it. The flip side of it is that when you go home, you might become lazy. If that's your fear that when I go home, I'm going to get lazy, then you're trying to fight a sincerity battle and then you end up losing out on the world altogether. Then just go in the corner and pray yourself. Okay? Worry about your ultimate level of sincerity another day, inshallah. On a rainy day, we'll focus on that. But for now, at least make sure it becomes a part of your habit and you don't end up losing that. Indeed, your masajid are for Allah. The sajda or the place of sajda, they're for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَا اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Do not call anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're in the masjid, you only worship Allah here. Nothing else. We don't allow anyone else or anything else to be worshipped here. I recall when I went to Turkey. Um, have any of you guys ever been to Turkey before? Anyone here? Some of you guys have been to Turkey? Yes. I went to Turkey as well. And when I went to Turkey, they take you on these tours. The, they have the Masjid tours, and then they take you to the Hagia Sophia, and then the Blue Mosque, and they take you to Sultan Ayyub, and all the other, radiallahu ta'ala, and, and all the different Masjid, and they, take, they have different tours there. So when we, a, when we went on a tour, my wife and I, I was newly married, and so we went to Turkey, and we were entering into the Hagia Sophia. It's a, it's a big museum. For those of you who've been, you know it's a very big museum. And that museum was actually made into a Masjid by Sultan. Right? The king who conquered, if I'm correct, Sultan Fatih, Sultan Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Fatih II, if I'm correct, that's his name. He was the one who conquered, and when he conquered, he made, what happened was that when he came there, when he conquered the city, all the Christians ran inside the church. It was called the Hagia Sophia, it was a church. They ran inside there and they closed the door. Sultan Muhammad, he came to the door, he knocked on the, he knocked, Sultan Muhammad, he knocked on the door. And he said, what are you guys, why do you guys close the doors for? We've conquered the city, why are you guys inside? They said, God is going to lift us into the sky just as he lifted Jesus. We're, we're going to go into the sky now. So Sultan Muhammad opened the door. He said, guys, no, you're not going anywhere. You're staying right here. He said, and, and he let them all loose. After letting them all loose, he said, I will turn this place into a masjid. And he turned that into a masjid. This is the narration that we have. He turned that into a masjid. And after he turned it into a masjid, what happened was that as time went on, now when you go there, and then after he built that masjid, that after he turned that church into a masjid, what he did was right in front of it, he built another masjid too. And that was to show that we don't live off your architecture. We actually have our own skill too. And he built this beautiful masjid. When you go to the Sultan, you know, the Sultan's mosque, which is known as the Blue Mosque, it's a very beautiful masjid, especially when you look at it from the sea, from the water, the, the Bosphorus River. When you look at it from that angle, it looks very beautiful because it actually shades in with the water. Clearly, regardless, now they've turned the Hagia Sophia, which once upon a time was turned into a masjid, into a, into a museum. So when you go there, you have, you know, the statue of Isa alayhi salam there, and you have at the same time, you know, Islamic uh, uh, relics there as well. You'll find, you know, it's kind of like a, everything's there, like kitchen, as you call it in our language. You know, everything's in there. You have a little Christianity, a little Islam, a little this, a little that. 
So when we walked in there, I said to my wife that, you know, we will take our shoes off. And the tour guy said, what are you guys doing? I said, because we Muslims believe that once something, once a place is a masjid, that remains a masjid. So whether you treat it as a masjid or not, that's between you and Allah on the day of judgment. But I have to treat it as a masjid. You guys understand? Right? And that's how we treated it, as a masjid. We did the best we could, and we treated it as a masjid. Because the masajid are for Allah, and once they turn into a masjid, then you can't call anyone other than Allah there. It's only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I had intention to actually finish off the entire surah, but I think we spent so much on that one word, masjid, that we couldn't go forward. So we'll stop here. We'll end on ayah number 18. That's where we started, and then we'll stop here. And inshallah, next week we'll continue on from ayah number 19. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallah, wa bihamdi. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك آخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته